Thank you, Julie. Hi, everyone. I look forward to chatting with you a bit later in the presentation. Thanks for joining us. I'm pretty excited to be uh, offering this webinar with Horse SA, being a horse lover and avid horse rider and follower of Horse SA. It's great to be doing some work with Julie, which has really come off the back of about mm, probably nine or so months worth of collaborative conversations about how we can how we can offer some great new services to the equestrian community um, through yoga and mindfulness and a whole bunch of other stuff that Julie and I both love as a kind of personal development thing, but also for the welfare of horses. So thanks for joining us. I'll kick off. If you have any problems with the screen or my voice, if you could let Julie know and then she'll, she'll pop in and, and let me know. Okay, a little bit about me. So I'm sharing with you a couple of my happy places and I'll talk about why I'm sharing my happy places with you in the next slide. But for now, I guess, for me as a young, as a young girl, maybe like some of you, I don't know if we've got any guys on the, on the listing, but as a young girl, I really dreamed a lot about horses and lots of animals actually, animal lover, but I dreamed a lot about horses and one day owning a horse, one day having my own property, um, but it was quite a far away dream at that time. I was living in suburbia with parents who didn't really think much about horses. Um, but anyway, it's, it's taken a long journey, I guess, until I was kind of in my late uh, 20s, early 30s, until I was able to actually have my own horse. And I rescued a couple of horses to start with. This photo here is my first horse that I've actually purchased through choosing a horse rather than the horse choosing me through needing to be rescued. This is Honey. She's a warm blood mare and I love her to bits. And my relationship with her has really changed and grown over the last couple of years, mostly due to yoga. And it is definitely one of my happy places. Being at home, I live on a small farm in the Adelaide Hills. I'm a mother of three beautiful children. I also have two doggies and chooks and a bunch of wildlife around me. Uh, and I'm definitely living my dream and I think every day I'm pretty grateful for that and realise how amazing it is to be able to own a horse. Actually, I own three, um, but to be able to own a horse I can ride and, and live the lifestyle I want. So very much for me being with my horse or being with horses is definitely my happy place. It makes me feel joy on the inside. But then there are also many times where I feel like I'm not in that joy. And over the years, um, more so in the past than, than now, I've felt a lot of struggle and disappointment and a lot of barriers have come up for me as a horse rider, which is part of kind of this journey that I'm going to be sharing with you. And the other photo on the other side, me, that's rice on my head, by the way. I've uh, just finished a month in Bali in this photo where I've undertaken my yoga teacher training. I've just been in a blessing ceremony where I've been given blessings for a prosperous future and all that kind of really nice stuff that happens over in Bali. And I'm really in my element as far as connecting with myself, connecting deep with who I am, connecting with my inner peace, with my inner happiness, which is what my yoga journey offers me. So these are my two happy places. I do have many more, but most relevant to this webinar are these two zones. So why am I talking about happiness and why would I talk to you about my happiness and how is happiness and inner peace important? Well, this quote here I think sums it up for me. If you can't find peace within yourself, you'll never find it anywhere else. And I think often we look outside for answers. Uh, we look outside for people to make us feel happy. We blame people when we aren't happy. Uh, we tell people they've made us happy. But really at the end of the day, if we don't know what that peaceful feeling is within us, if it doesn't start with us, then it can't actually be experienced outside of us. You can't experience things like joy and peace and love and contentment and happiness if you don't actually know how that feels within you, honestly, deeply within you. I think the more you strengthen your place of inner peace, the more you project it. So where your attention goes, energy flows. I'd like you to just stop for a moment, whatever you're doing. You might be paying attention to me. You might be half paying attention 
to me, but I'd like you to really arrive with listening to my voice right now and paying complete attention because I'm going to share two quotes with you that I'd like you to really, really listen to and acknowledge. So as you're sitting there, if you're doing something, can you stop what you're doing? Can you perhaps close your eyes? You don't have to, but if you want to close your eyes to really tune in, I'd like to share two things with you. Peace is the result of retraining your mind to process life as it is rather than how you think it should be. Peace is accepting today, releasing yesterday, and giving up the need to control tomorrow. And if you think about this in relation to your horse, and you're wanting your horse to be present, you're wanting your horse to feel relaxed, then where are you in this space? Where are you sitting within the realms of peacefulness or distraction? How mindful are you when you're interacting with your horse so I'd like you to take a moment now to turn within you've heard a little bit about me I've offered you a couple of quotes to set the scene and now I'd like you to spend a moment or two either writing jotting down in a journal if you have one near you or closing your eyes and I'd like you to think about where your happy place is and where you feel most peaceful and if you can't think of a time with your horse, then think of just any other time in your life. But I'd like you to give priority on thinking about a time with your horse or with, with a horse when you have felt really happy and very peaceful. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and I'd like you to think about that. I'd like you to recall that time. If you recall a time, I'd like you to think about the detail. Where were you? What were you doing? And ultimately, how connected did you feel with your horse when you were sitting in a place of being peaceful and happy? And maybe for some of us, there's no memory there of that. But I really hope for many of us that there are many memories. But it's an interesting thing to think about, like where... And were you really happy and content and peaceful with your horse? So what is the connection between feeling inner peace, riding your horse, and your relationship with your horse? Maybe have a think about that yourself. So inner peace is closely related to being present, being in the now, or what some people call being in the moment. So once we leave Leave the present moment. We're either in the past or the future. So I want you to think about your horse for a moment. So when you ride or you're with your horse, which state of mind would you like your horse to be in? Would you like your horse to be in the past? And generally when we're hooked in the past, it's usually about replaying a fear or something that's happened that wasn't pleasant. It's very hard to prioritise in the mind the past in a happy mode, the mind automatically goes to stuff that didn't go so well. So would you want your horse to be in that state? Would you want your horse to be projecting into the future, being anxious about what might be coming? Or would you want your horse to be in the state of now, where the horse is feeling peaceful, where the horse is feeling relaxed, and where the connection between you and your horse is the strongest? So I think we'd probably all agree that being present in the moment with the horse, with the horse being present with you, is probably the most ideal state that we would want a horse to be to be in. And those of you that ride, I'm sure there are many moments where you feel deeply connected and like you're one with your horse, like you're so together and so connected. And that requires you both to be very present. But what we often do is we project this need for the horse to be present and listening and with us and connected. But we're often not. We're flying out of our bodies on some past experience or out of our minds on some future um, expectation of ourselves or, or even worse, we have the inner critic in there playing this record of, oh, you did this last time and you'll probably do that again or you're not good enough or whatever. And all of those things keep us from being in the moment. And the moment is where the magic happens. You would know that uh, with going to see a friend, having a coffee, having a catch-up, or even your partner, if you don't stop and breathe together, 
if you don't stop and be present with each other. The quality of the relationship becomes very poor. So I'd like you to imagine that if both you and your horse were present together, is this the kind of connection that you want to have? And then I'd like you also to have a think about whether honestly you can answer that question of whether you are mostly present or often present when you're with your horse or are you really just in some past or future state of anxiety or worry when you're with your horse and how do you think that then translates to the relationship that you have with your horse and ultimately with yourself because the secret is, we talked about revealing some of the secrets here, yeah? The secret actually isn't about your horse. The secret is really about you. And really, it all starts with you. And if you don't know how to access this sense of peacefulness and breathing and learning to find your calm and learning to connect in with that very deep anchor of being content and present and peaceful, then how do you have the ability to be present and mindful with your horse? more likely to have an accident if you're not mindful. You're more likely to have things play out in your mind, which can then project on the horse's mind. Horses are very psychic and intuitive. All of the things that are going on within you, the horse is experiencing either on an energetic level or even on a physical level with the tension and changes in the body as you're riding, even in your hands. So really, we want to let go of the past fears. We want to let go of future anxiety. And we really want to be here and now. I think we can all agree that that is probably the best place we can be for the welfare of the horse and for the welfare of us as we ride this beautiful creature. So how's all this got to do anything with yoga? What about yoga? Why would we do it? And how, how can it transform your riding and your relationship with your horse? I'm obviously talking from my own experience here when I share this webinar with you. But I can also say that the many, many women and and sometimes guys, but mostly women that come to me and come to me for the first time doing yoga are completely in the same category that I was before I started deepening my yoga practice and realizing the benefits of yoga to my horse riding and to my attitude and my relationship with my horse. So what is yoga? So yoga, the word literally translates to yoke. And what we mean by that is union. And what we mean by union is that yoga itself as a practice, which includes includes a physical practice, which is called asana, and it includes meditation and breathing techniques and a whole bunch of other really great stuff. So what we're doing when we do yoga is we're trying to create a union between the mind and the body. So I'd like to ask you another question here. When you ride, or even as you're here right now listening to this webinar, how connected is your mind with your body? Do you have arguments between the two? Does the mind sometimes ask the body to do something and the body doesn't want to? How much of a union and cooperation is there between the mind and the body? And I'd like to ask you if you have that, if you don't have that union between your mind and your body and they're not getting along and there's lots of arguments going on in your head, then how does that then translate to you as a horse rider? What kind of mixed up messages do you think you might be giving your horse as you're riding? So that's what yoga word, the word of yoga actually means it means to yoke to union to join the mind and the body which is the sole really purpose of what yoga is and then there are a whole other lot of benefits outside of what happens when you join the mind and the body yoga is also a very personal journey it's not competitive it's not about looking on instagram and seeing how cool people are doing poses it's not about doing headstands or handstands it's about learning to be quiet enough to listen to yourself to be present with yourself Self and to take that journey. There's a beautiful quote kicking around that says, yoga is a journey of the self, through the self, to the self. They say that the yoga asanas, the yoga postures, are really just movements for the body so that the mind can connect deeper with the body. It's not really about what the physical body looks like or what it ends up looking like. It's about the personal journey that you go on through the yoga practice, through joining the mind mind and the body together and we, when you own your own breath when you are the owner of the way you breathe then no one can steal your peace your peace is your inner strength 
And when you're in charge of your breasts and you know how to use your breasts, then that peace won't go away. No one can take that from you. So one of the greatest gifts that yoga offers is learning the ability to control the breasts. And also, quite importantly, to move with the breasts. And when you're moving with conscious breathing, then you're able to be mindful of the breasts and of the body. So if you can translate this to horse riding, when you're riding your horse and maybe doing dressage or some other competitive type sport, you want to be hearing the horse breathe in a really beautiful rhythmic pattern. You want to know that the horse is taking those full, full conscious, deep breaths. But are you doing that when you're riding? So are you being the leader? Are you showing the way? Or are you putting unreal expectations on your horses without actually practicing it yourself? So this this is where yoga can be super helpful with writing is you learn to be that example. You learn to breathe and you learn to master your own breath. Other gifts that yoga offers are increased body and mind awareness. So one of my students said to me recently, you know, I've lost so much weight and it's not just because I come to yoga. It's because I realized that by doing yoga and having some internal personal awareness, I realized that I'm actually toxic inside, she said. I feel sick all the time. Time. The stuff that I eat doesn't suit me. And from doing yoga and becoming more aware of how her body feels, she realized that most of the stuff she was eating was actually causing damage to her. So not just from doing the yoga practice did she lose weight, but she started making choices, conscious decisions about what she wanted to eat and the type of exercise she wanted to do that really suited her well-being. Also, yoga, yoga brings an increase in flexibility an increase in strength, an increase in balance, and an increase in stamina. So it's quite different than other forms of exercise in the way it's not just doing all these physical things, but the yoga asanas themselves, which have been around for thousands of years, are designed to connect the mind and the breath more deeply with the body. So it's not just an exercise. It's much deeper than that. But it doesn't need to be spiritual. It can be, but it is a journey that goes within. So when Julie and I planned this webinar, we talked about some of the things we'd noticed with horse riders we'd met. And particularly for me, for lots of horse riding women that come to me in yoga, some of the things we see. So for me, I guess I can sum it up by saying the thing about horse riders, gosh, is horse is number one. Horse is number one. And if you have a family, maybe they're number two, <laughs> or maybe the family's number one, or maybe they share number one with the horse. I don't know. Everyone's different. But basically, the people themselves that come to me are not number one. The people themselves that come to me put themselves so far down on the list and they think that riding is all they need and riding makes them happy. Yes, this is true, but how well is the riding going? How well is the relationship with the horse going? How much time is spent in frustration? How much time is focused on looking outside of themselves and looking at the horse and looking at others? Imagine the benefit if you gave yourself number one, and you nourished yourself through well-being practices. And it doesn't have to take up extra time in your life. It can just take up five minutes. And I'm going to show you a five-minute practice a little bit later. But it doesn't have to be this huge impost and add-on to your life. But they say that if you do yoga, you increase your time. Meaning if you do yoga, all of a sudden, everything else in your life seems to be easier with less effort and less barriers. So it's really important, I think, when you are riding a horse and you want to look after your body, that you do something that really nourishes you at a soul level, at a physical level and at a mental level. And I was so surprised when I ran my first horse riding uh, yoga workshop, I don't know, a little while, like nine months ago or so, maybe even a year ago, at all these amazing women and a few guys that came along to this workshop. And I tell you, the majority of them had very little flexibility. The majority of them had very little stamina and the majority of them had very little spatial awareness or awareness of their own limbs on their body so when I said move the left arm or do something with the right leg the consciousness and the ability to actually be present and hear the instruction and move was very low 
and people really couldn't access most of the basic yoga asanas that I showed them, which to me was a huge surprise because if you're going to ride a horse, surely you have to be flexible, you have to be strong, you have to be body aware, but no, a lot of us are kicking around and we haven't got that stuff going on. And think of the amazing improvements that you can achieve through your riding and just your own personal sense of self-worth through being able to increase all of those things in your life and become a better rider for you and also for your horse. So some of the gifts of yoga, an introduction on how to become, sorry, how to overcome barriers and how to ride at your best. Well, as we've kind of gone over a little bit, I'm just gonna repeat some of this stuff. Yoga primarily helps you build self-awareness. It helps you join the mind with the body, with the breath. Yoga will also help you notice when your thoughts or actions are toxic. It will help you to become self-aware. It will help you to connect with your deep, peaceful self, and it will help you stretch, release, stimulate, build your body in a holistic way, and it also, some of the yoga poses help you undo injury. So really, I mean, yoga isn't the answer to everything, but it is a damn good answer to a whole lot of stuff. And I think as horse riders, we ought to give a yoga practice a go to really connect deeper with the best we can be. So this is all about sending you, uh, sorry, sharing with you some things that you can do at home. So this is a webinar, it goes for half an hour. You can listen back to it as many times as you want but some stuff that you can do at home that can help you build into a practice yourself. So I don't know if you've heard much about gratitude, but a gratitude journal is probably one of the most powerful things I have ever, ever come across and experienced in my life. For those of you that know about gratitude and about cultivating gratitude is this notion of how to build happiness, uh, how to be content and peaceful, being grateful in, in some moments of your day is the key to this. So if you have a special book or you could go out and buy a special book and you could every morning when you wake up write something that you're grateful for even if it's I'm grateful for having that amazing piece of fruit loaf this morning gosh it was good or I'm amazing for that great juice or I'm amazed I'm really grateful for my horse giving me a ride today even though I struggled so I'd compel you to own take on a gratitude journal and do it every day and notice the difference it makes because the negative thinking comes so easily so the positive thinking really has to come through um, some kind of ritualistic practice some kind of repetitive habitual practice the so gratitude journal make a time every day and do it that's one of the most powerful things you can do another one positive affirmations so how often do you hear crappy thoughts going on in your head, stuff going around and around, things about yourself that you don't really like, things about other people you don't really like, really negative conversations and repetitive thoughts. So take control of that and maybe choose each day a word that you're going to stick with. So it might be balance, it might be smiley, it might be healthy or breathing or whatever it is. Choose a word and stick with that word or build a sentence. Today I'm choosing to breathe deeply. Today I'm choosing to eat healthily. Whatever it is give yourself a chance to reset some of what the mental patterns are. Another technique is meditation on mindfulness. Julie and I are going to be running another webinar on um, meditation on mindfulness for equestrians and that'll go a bit deeper into that so I'm not going to go really deep into that but basically that's about learning techniques that help you become more present in the moment which isn't about clearing the mind and making it empty and being this peaceful person sitting in a cave meditating. It's about learning how to see and hear the thoughts that come in and just observe them and let them go and then retrain the brain to think on things that are actually useful for you instead of damaging you. And of course, I'm a massive advocate for yoga practice. I went to yoga practice. I've been doing yoga for more than 25 years. I went to a deeper yoga practice about three years ago, became a teacher, absolutely love it. I can't speak highly enough of the changes I see in my students once they come to yoga and also the personal changes that I've experienced myself through dedicating to a yoga practice. So as a little gift, we're offering a short yoga practice here to support your writing. So there's a link there for a YouTube uh, video that I put on last night or this morning. If you don't have the ability to watch this, I've done this really uh, quite busy little diagram here that shows you what, I'm just gonna flick forward for a 
moment all of these postures are and it just kind of shows you what they are in a circle and how you do them and how you start and how you finish and here are the images so we start here with this beautiful breathing for a couple of minutes in the video I've only done it for about 30 seconds but you can really take as long as you want here and the objective is just to open the palms sit in a comfortable position it doesn't have to be in this shape it can be with the legs out you can sit on a cushion or a chair or anything where the spine can be upright and start to breathe and the simple practice of closing the eyes and starting to breathe very consciously will show you amazing things about yourself it'll show you how you're feeling it'll show you whether you're rushing or holding the breath and it will show you how to relax so starting whatever your yoga practice practice may be just with a minute or two of this calm relaxed breathing with open palms and a straight spine will be a very beautiful thing for you to do daily if you can the next asana uh, sequence here is cat cow so the lady in the green tights the second one over so she's stretching um, convex concaving the back so back bend and then pushing the back up spinal health this position is all about spinal health so before you start your day before you get ready to chuck the horse and the float and go to a competition if you don't do anything else just some breathing and this cat cow asana will be incredibly beneficial to you it'll unlock the hips unlock the sacrum the whole of the back the throat the chest the arms the whole lot the next asana we're looking at is downward dog and the reason I put this little slide in here with all these cues it's because people can do downward dog pretty badly. It's one of those poses that's very hard to do correctly, even though it's the most common pose we use in yoga and everybody does it. So there's some great little cues there for you to practice with. And it does take a little while to get the heels to come down to the mat and it totally depends on the tightness of your hamstrings and calves. So that's the next part of the sequence, downward dog. And then from downward dog, the video flows into what we call plank. And you'll notice here that there's kind of this beautiful um, like slanted line from this lady's heels to the back of her knees, to her bum bum, to her shoulders, and then the back of her head and that she has the feet apart and the wrists are directly under the shoulders. So holding this position for three seconds or five seconds or maybe even one second is incredibly beneficial for the core. You can see how much her core is turned on and the muscles are switched on from this. If you practice even these four kind of sequences at the top every day, within a week you'll notice the difference in your strength. If you can't do plank on your feet, then you can also come down to your knees and do plank like that the next asana is upward facing dog and upward facing dog can also be done with the legs on the mat and the elbows bent which is called baby cobra as an option if this is too strong for you but these poses all join together so far they form a beautiful kind of overall sequence so again I'm showing you uh, on this slide some of the tips to upward facing dog from upward facing dog we move back into downward facing dog and then into crescent Pose, which is the lady in the blue singlet with her arms up in the air so this is a beautiful hip stretch and hip opener it's also a chest opener and opens up the side meridians of the heart and lung chakras uh, so heart and lung uh, meridians on the side of the body there allowing the breath to be really full and open beautiful hip stretch and then we go back into downward dog and then we do low crescent on the other side so this is the left leg forward now so first of all right leg and then left leg and then we go down into downward dog again and then we walk the feet towards the hands and we look up which is called Uttanasana A and then we look down and stretch all the way down Uttanasana B and we usually spend about four or five breaths in Uttanasana this forward fold and then you can gently come to lay on the mat or anything you've got that you're using to do this little practice with open the palms allow the feet to be relaxed close the eyes and if you have an eye pillow you can put it on and spend two to eight minutes just being here with this slow relaxed breathing in the same way you had your palms open at the start of the practice and just breathing and allowing this beautiful exercise to assimilate through the whole of the body so there's a really gorgeous five minute practice you can actually repeat that you know ten times if you're super energetic or if you do it once the first time and then maybe the next week you kind of go for twice and you just can keep repeating these rounds um, overall body conditioning 
core, back stretch, glute release, the whole lot. So that's it for our little webinar. Um, and here's some information if you want to know more. There's a link to my Facebook page for Inspire Yoga and Coaching. Julie and I are running another webinar soon on mindfulness. Um, there's also a program that I'm launching online coaching called Equestrian Breeze, uh, which is one-on-one -on -one or small groups where I take you through some breathing, uh, mindfulness tools, some guided practice, some goal setting and vision, vision planning that's personalized to you. I'm also starting a 21 day Equestrian Breathe challenge, which is a coaching kind of every day for 21 days. It's online again. You can join as a group or as individuals. And I offer short videos and techniques to build your awareness and calm, integrating a basic yoga practice. And also it's designed to help you build a routine. So the 21 days is the time it takes to break and set a new, new routine. So it's designed especially to help people get that routine definitely into their body, into their system. We also have timetables for our yoga practice if you live in the hills or you visit the hills. And I also run uh, Nourish Yoga Retreats in Bali uh, that are super fun. And if you're looking to kind of make a transformation in your life or take that leap into I really want to do this and get into this yoga thing and get into my health then you are very welcome to come to Bali with me. Here's my contact details you can access anytime by looking back over this webinar and I just want to say thank you for joining me it's been really um, great sharing some of the things I know about health and writing and wellness and it's also wonderful to again do a collaboration with Julie. Thank you.